Chapter 16. The Storm. I'm sorry, man. I can't join you at the lake today. Zack looked over at Noah and shrugged. No worries, he said. I don't expect you to canoe with me every day. Noah sighed. Brennan signed me up for the three-on-three volleyball tournament, and he really needs me this afternoon. Go have some fun, Zack grinned. But I'll expect you back on the lake tomorrow. Noah laughed and promised to be there. Then he hurried off to his game. For a moment, Zack wondered if he should go watch the tournament. It would be exciting. Brennan, Noah, and Simon were up against some stiff competition, and he could cheer them on. But what if someone gets injured and needs a substitute? I'm not sure I could stop myself from jumping in. Wandering down toward the water, Zack was deep in thought. He and Uncle James had gone out for a jog that morning, and while he hadn't told his uncle, he had felt very lightheaded on the way back. What a pain this concussion stuff has been. Will it always be a problem for me? And what if I'm accidentally hit again? Could it get worse? Not only was Zack feeling a little unnerved by the dizziness he had experienced that morning, the talk his uncle had given the evening before had kept him awake for many hours. Uncle James had made a strong case for believing that Jesus could come back at any time. Zack had always thought that he would see Israel dwelling in peace in the sudden northern invasion before Jesus returned to gather his saints to him. However, Uncle James put forward the view that Jesus may come unknown to the rest of the world, resurrect the dead, judge those who are responsible to him, and then spend time, maybe ten years or more, instructing and building a relationship with the saints. Uncle James called this the marriage feast of the Lamb. The time when Jesus Christ is preparing the saints, Uncle James suggested. Maybe when the prophet Elijah will go throughout the land of Israel, turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers as it says in Malachi. Elijah's work in preparing the nation to accept their Messiah may be what precipitates the time of peace and prosperity for Israel, spoken of in Ezekiel 38. When Israel is feeling safe and secure, that is the cue for the northern confederacy of nations to storm the Middle East, take Egypt, and return to decimate Israel, cutting off two-thirds of the population. It will likely be at this time, Uncle James said, when all the nations are gathered against Jerusalem, that Jesus and the saints will come to the aid of the Jewish people. For the last couple of years, Zach had delayed making a commitment to God, based on his view that there was still more to happen before Jesus could return. What if Uncle James's view of prophecy is right? He pondered. What if there is nothing left that needs to happen before we are called away to judgment? What if Jesus truly could be here tonight or tomorrow? The answers to these questions were disturbing. I know I'm not ready, he told himself. I'm totally not ready. As Zack neared the beach, he was surprised how intense the wind was down by the shore. White caps topped the waves and foamed up on the sand. A dark cloud lay on the horizon. Looks like a storm is brewing, he thought. Maybe we'll have the rain by nightfall. I hope it doesn't hit until we're all in our tents asleep. Rain and camping don't mix well. Going against such a wind would make it very difficult to canoe alone. Zack knew he would almost certainly find himself turning in circles. He put on a life jacket and looked down the shoreline for anyone he could invite to go with him. And then he saw Hannah. Striding down the beach in a bright pink t-shirt and white shorts, Hannah appeared to be looking for someone. Catching sight of Zack, she waved and began walking toward him. Do you need someone to canoe with? She asked, hopefully. Sure, Zack said with a friendly shrug. Taking a second life jacket from the clothesline that hung by the shore, Zack handed it to her. Hannah would be welcome company. Did Noah say something to his sister? He wondered. As they were bringing the canoe down to the water, one of the lifeguards warned them to be careful. I haven't let any of the younger kids go out today, he said. That wind is awfully strong. Something is blowing in. Don't go too far. We'll be all right, Zack assured him. It might be tough heading out, but at least we'll be blown back to shore. Just stay close by. Zack nodded, but he thought the lifeguard was overreacting. If the wind had been blowing in the opposite direction, the warning might have been necessary. Insisting that he steer, Hannah climbed into the front of the canoe. I didn't have any sports this afternoon, she said, taking off her sandals. She preferred bare feet whenever possible. Our team got knocked out of the tournament after a second game. Privately, Zach pondered that Hannah's team hadn't had a chance. He had seen the names on the sports bulletin. Three 14-year-old girls up against older teen guys. What were they thinking? It soon became apparent to him that Hannah wasn't sure how to canoe, either. You don't need to paddle on both sides. Just stick to one, Zack told her. Okay. Are you comfortable holding the paddle like that? 
Not really. Try moving your hands further apart. Okay. I've never done this before, she giggled. Really? Are you being sarcastic? Of course not. You look like a pro. I was going to ask you for lessons. A large splash of water landed on his shorts. Zack smiled. Of course he could have easily drenched her in return, but he didn't want to do that. The wind was chilly. It'll be an easy trip back, he reminded Hannah. The wind will blow us in. She turned around to give him a friendly smile. Hannah's smile was warm and inviting. I really enjoyed your uncle's talk last night, Hannah said, taking a break from paddling and turning to face him. Zack nodded thoughtfully. He'd noticed during his uncle's talk that Hannah was diligently taking notes. It looked like a good way to keep focus on the class. He thought he might try it sometime. What did you think of the talk? she asked. It was good, Zack admitted half-heartedly, straining at the paddle. Just good? she questioned with a puzzled expression. That talk made me so aware of all that is going on in the world. What with Russia becoming a guardian to Turkey, Iraq, and Iran, and building up ships at Port Tartus, and many nations condemning Israel and calling for Jerusalem to be an international city, everything is happening just as God said it would. All nations are going to be gathered against Jerusalem very soon. I've decided when I get home, I'm going to get baptized. Right away? Zach exclaimed, paddling harder since Hannah had decided she'd rather talk. Well, I might need one or two more baptismal classes, she considered, but my dad has been going over things with me for a year, and now I want to speed it up. Jesus could return at any time. A shiver went down Zach's spine. But but you're so young, he objected. Aren't you only fourteen? Digging in with her paddle again, Hannah glanced back reproachfully. I know people who have been baptized at fourteen. It's not that young. Besides, I'll be fifteen in a month. Sorry. Zack apologized, realizing he had upset her. I guess your brother was baptized at 14, and Jake was only a year older. Hannah smiled. It was obvious she remembered that detail well. But didn't you feel, after your uncle's talk, that Jesus is going to return any time now? She questioned earnestly. It's so close. I want to be ready. Your uncle quoted that verse, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. I know how important it is to be in Christ and have our sins forgiven. I want to be part of the promises. Zack looked back to shore. They were making very slow progress, especially with only one person doing the work. He didn't really want to discuss this topic. His own thoughts were disturbing enough. Bending his head to the wind, he paddled with all his strength. Are you baptized, Zack? She asked, digging in again with her paddle. He had hoped she wouldn't ask that question. No. So don't you feel the urgency? Sometimes. Seeing how hard Zack was paddling, Hannah put in more effort as well for a while. She stopped asking those deep, penetrating questions. Zack was relieved. His uncle's talk had been unsettling, but he still wasn't sure what it meant for him. People have been preaching about the nearness of Christ's return for years, he told himself. It's certainly getting closer every day, but I don't think it's time to panic. Eventually, they made it out to the middle of the lake. The wind was getting stronger and the sky was clouding over. A drop of water landed on Zack's arm. Then a few more landed on his face. He brushed them off, thinking the wind was spraying the lake water against them. It's raining, Hannah called out. Should we head back? Looking up at the sky, Zack realized the dark cloud which had been on the horizon was now looming over them. Sure, he agreed, but then it began to pour. A freak storm had blown in quickly, and with the rain came a fierce wind. There were even pellets of hail. As Zack attempted to turn the canoe around, the waves were coming across the lake so high that some were splashing over the sides of the canoe. Hannah was trying to say something to him, but Zack couldn't hear. He could barely even see the rain was so heavy. They managed to turn the canoe around, but were swamped by a wave that was at least two feet high. The canoe began to sink, and they scrambled to find a bailing can. As the warm lake water began to pour in around them, Zack looked up to see a look of shock on Hannah's face. Wearing clothes, neither one of them had planned to go swimming. Overturning into the shallow lake, the canoe floated upside down. Its former occupants floundered in the choppy water, attempting to find their footing in the thick mud below. Not for a moment did Zack feel they were in any danger, especially not with life jackets on. The water only came up to Hannah's waist, with the occasional waves sweeping past her shoulders. The noise of the rain and the wind was deafening. Talking was nearly impossible. Zack motioned for Hannah to help him right the canoe. Together they tugged and pulled, flipping the canoe back over. Zack was thankful for its buoyant design. 
The paddles and safety kit had been carried off by the waves. They would have to retrieve them when the storm died down. Hannah was searching for something in the water. I've lost my sandals, she called out to him. We'll find them later, Zach called back. Bowing their heads against the driving rain, they pulled the canoe toward the nearby shore. It was private property that was out of bounds to everyone at camp, but in these exceptional circumstances, they needed a safe haven to wait out the storm. It was about 50 meters to shore, and progress was slow, stepping over so many slippery, sharp rocks and tugging on the canoe. They were both relieved to reach the sandy beach and find shelter under the overhanging trees. They'll be worried about us, Hannah tried to shout over the noise as they settled on a rock under a large tree. Zack looked toward the camp beach. He could barely see anyone or anything through the downpour and assumed that anyone on the distant shore would be unable to see them. It'll be over soon, he shouted back. As they sat crouched under the trees, drenched from head to toe and half blinded by the pouring rain, Zack could see that Hannah was shivering badly. The wind was intense. Blowing against the wetness of their clothing, it felt very cold. Zack contemplated whether or not to put his arm around her. He didn't want to put any ideas in Hannah's young, 14-year-old head, but he didn't want her to die of hypothermia, either. You cold? He called out. Freezing! Reaching out, Zack drew her close. Thanks, she said, her teeth shattering. As they sat together in the pouring rain, Zack imagined himself telling Jake about this very incident. Yeah, and Hannah was freezing cold. He heard himself telling his brother. So I had to put my arm around her to keep her warm, poor thing. Would Jake care? He smiled to himself. It was kind of funny in an ironic sort of way. The wind began to die down and the rain decreased. Looking over at Hannah, Zach caught her amused glance in his direction and they both laughed. How did we get here? He chuckled. I don't know, she replied. I thought I was going for a nice little canoe ride. I didn't expect a shipwreck. Shipwreck? Zack threw his head back and laughed. It wasn't a shipwreck. Sure it was, Hannah smiled, her teeth chattering. Our boat was swamped by the waves and we went down with the ship. It just wasn't a very deep lake, thankfully, she added with a grin. But we have our ship back, Zack protested. But we had to rescue our ship, Hannah argued. And now look around us, she said. It's like we're stranded on a deserted island. We can't even see any other people. It was true that through the heavy rain, they couldn't see far beyond where they were sitting. Zack could see the beach again, but all the people had run for shelter. But we could walk back to them if we wanted to, he argued. And I'll have to go deep sea diving to find my sandals. You're a nut, Zack laughed affectionately. They continued to amuse themselves over whether or not they had been in a shipwreck until Zack noticed that the two lifeguards had reappeared and were anxiously pacing the shore and looking out across the lake. We'd better let them know that we're safe, he called out. Standing up, he began waving his arms. Hannah did the same. Soon they could tell that they had been spotted. Picking up an extra set of paddles, the lifeguards climbed into a canoe and set off towards them. Hannah was still shaking badly. Keep your blood flowing, Zack told her as he began doing jumping jacks. Following his lead, Hannah joined in and they jumped steadily until they warmed up enough to re-enter the water. With a little deep sea diving, the sandals and safety kit were easily found. The paddles had washed up on shore. Chapter 17. The Other Camp After the very first day, Jake was certain he had made the right decision. Basketball camp was exactly what he needed to develop the skills that could make the difference next season. It was hard work, it was demanding, but he loved every minute. Everyone woke at seven and did an hour of exercise before breakfast. The camp was in a scenic part of Nova Scotia on a lake. The trail that Jake, Jaden, and all the others ran on every morning followed the shoreline. In the early morning sunlight, mists rolled across their pathway. Loons and herons busied themselves catching breakfast in the calm, peaceful water. It was such a beautiful sight. Jake felt like he could run for hours in such a picturesque setting. With a weak ankle, Jake didn't start off as the fastest runner. However, he set his sights on moving up the line from day to day. He aimed to at least match the Blackhawks players. 
Competitive juices were flowing strong, and he yearned to regain all the muscle power he'd lost in the last two months. Sometimes while he was running on the trails or lifting weights in the training room, Jake thought about what his brother would be doing. He knew he wouldn't be playing in the married versus single competitions that Jake loved, or in any of the three-on-three volleyball games. Instead, he imagined his brother sitting on the hard wooden chairs, listening to one boring talk after another as he slowly became more and more out of shape. I'll be passing him by in every run next week, Jake thought to himself with a smile. Even when Jake thought about the old friends that his brother would be hanging out with, he didn't feel more than a twinge of regret. I don't have to try and pretend to be someone I'm not, he told himself. Zach is probably trying to sound like he knows lots about the Bible and has faith in God and stuff like that. I get to be here with people who think I'm great, just the way I am. Sometimes it bothered Jake to think that Hannah might be following Zach around. But then again, he was getting a good number of texts every day from Melissa, since she couldn't get in touch with his twin. We can just trade girls, Jake thought with a dreamy smile. I wouldn't mind at all. After breakfast, the coaches worked individually with all the attendees for an hour on developing their foul shooting abilities. This had always been an area of weakness for Jake, but by the third day, he had gone from a 60% average to 80. Jaden was at 90. What a difference this will make, he thought with delight. Playing center position, he was often fouled. Many times, Brett had told them that games can be won or lost at the foul line. In a close game, the foul shots are vital. In the afternoon, the boys were free to go cliff jumping into the clear deep water without any slime or leeches. There were many other water activities to choose from, windsurfing, kayaking, wakeboarding. There was even a jet ski. They had all signed up for a turn on the jet ski. In the woods were high ropes, climbing walls, and fabulous trails. Jake was trying it all and having a marvelous time. Not everything was perfect. Sometimes the jokes were crude and Jake was sure from the snickers and looks that a couple of the guys were passing around lewd pictures on their phones. Once or twice, he had overheard the Blackhawks captain whispering about the so-called insulin injections that he gave himself after breakfast, which likely explained his ripped physique. Jake was thankful to have Jaden with him for moral support. Not that Jake was tempted to do drugs of any kind. He had no desire to ruin his body or his life in such a short-sighted way, but he felt stronger in Jaden's company. From what Jake had observed, he and Jaden were the only Christians there, or at least the only ones brave enough to admit it. For the first few nights, Jake was so tired when they crawled into the thin, hard bunks that he fell instantly to sleep. However, on the fourth night, he woke up around midnight. A few of the guys were huddled close together around Trevor, the Blackhawks' captain, laughing rather loudly. They were the same guys that had been passing around the phone pictures. An eerie blue light emanated from the center of the group, and their eyes were focused on the source of that light. Oh, that's so awesome! One of them whispered, although not quietly enough. Go go back again! Whatever it was they were watching on the laptop, they all seemed awestruck by one particular scene. What's up? Jake whispered curiously, sitting up in his bed. You gotta see this, man! Trevor said quietly. It's great! What are you watching? Jake asked wearily. His good friend was still snoring heavily in the next bunk. Jaden had been proactive, bringing earplugs and an extra pillow to put over his head. Hell Rider! He jumps out of four trucks on his motorcycle! Trevor whispered. Check it out! Hell Rider? Jake remembered seeing the movie on Brett's desk. If Brett owned the movie, it had to be okay. It looks so exciting. Eagerly slipping out of bed, he joined the others. Police cars were chasing the motorcyclists, but he drove up the ramp of an empty car transport truck on the side of the road, picking up enough speed to jump four vehicles that had crashed in a pileup blocking the highway. One of the officers tried to follow but didn't make it and slammed into the side of an overturned transport. The rest of the police cars came to a screeching halt in front of the blockage with no choice but to watch Hellriders speed away. Jake took a seat on the bed with the others. This was great. A movie in the middle of the night and no one to tell them to go to bed? It wasn't hard to become fully absorbed until suddenly there was a scene with the girl. That was when he began to feel uncomfortable. What's the rating on this? He wondered. I can't believe Brett has this movie. But Jake couldn't drag himself away even when things got out of hand. I won't watch this stuff anywhere else. He promised himself. I'm only here for a week. Dad would ground me for a year if he caught me watching this stuff. But as Brett says, Dad is rather extreme. Brett must think it's okay. 
Jake was surprised by the effect the movie had on him long after it was over. He didn't feel tired at all. The sensual feelings the movie stirred up were way more powerful than anything he'd felt before. Not only that, but the next day, as he jogged around the trail and practiced his 101 foul shots, he kept wondering if the guys had any other movies to show or stories to tell. They did. After the lights were off, curtains were closed and almost everyone asleep, the laptop came out and the usual crowd gathered around. Jaden was invited, but he was too tired to stay up, or so he said. Jake was just as happy his friend decided to go to bed. He had an uneasy feeling that Jaden's conscience might be stronger than his own. The second movie was worse than the first. None of the guys with the laptop were the least embarrassed to watch the graphic scenes that flitted across the screen. They repeated the most tantalizing ones. Jake kept telling himself that he'd never do this again when he got home. His conscience burned with shame. Verses ran through his head. He who shuts his eyes from seeing evil, your eyes will see the king in his beauty. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things. The salacious images and the crude wild tales were hard to forget. Jake had always hoped that one day he'd find someone to marry. Up until now that someone had always been a girl who believed in God and wanted to live by God's morality. Of course, she also had to be pretty kind, intelligent, and fun to be with. However, marriage seems an eternity away. I still have to get through university, find a job, and and all that. Never mind the effort it might take to find the right girl. How can I wait that long? Zach and I are probably the only teens in Sterling High, or even our youth group, who haven't tried things out. Do I have to wait? What if I experiment a little, and then confess my sins and repented? God will always take us back, won't he? Jake didn't realize that inside his heart, a monster was arising. Spiritually low, he lacked the godly wisdom to perceive that his thoughts were dangerous. When it came time for everyone to pack up, Jake and Jaden got into a debate with the Blackhawks players over who was most likely to win the Provincials. It was a dumb argument that both sides knew better than to engage in, but it delayed the packing up that needed to be done. The Black Hawks coach stormed in and ended the dispute by demanding his players be in his van in five minutes. Brett still hadn't arrived, so Jake and Jaden were in no hurry. They stuffed their clothes into their bags and shook off the dirt from their running shoes while the other players filed out of the cabin. A text came in from Melissa. Hey Jake, I'm seriously thinking of breaking up with Shane. He's never around anyway. Do you think I should? Does Zach still care about me? It only took Jake a moment to respond. Sounds like a wise move to me. As far as I know, Zach still cares. But if he ever changes his mind about you, I won't. Love ya. With a smile, he tucked the phone in his pocket. My brother will be happy to hear she's going to ditch Shane, he thought. Lucky Zach. With all the fanciful thoughts he'd been indulging lately, Melissa was appearing more and more often in his dreams. The phone vibrated again. There was a response. Jake, you're so funny. Please tell Zach I miss him. It's nice to know he has a double in more ways than one. You bet. Looking around the cabin to make sure he hadn't left anything behind, Jake spotted something black under Trevor's bed. He stooped to investigate and was astonished to see the laptop. Trevor left his laptop, he exclaimed. Jake stooped over and pulled it out. The Blackhawks have already left, Jaden told him. How can we get it back to them? I guess I could drop it off at the administration building. Dark thoughts entered Jake's heart. Or I could take it home with me and see if I can find his address, he told his friend, all the while thinking. Then I can enjoy it for a week or so, or better yet, I could give it back when we meet up for basketball in November. I'll just say I was keeping it for him and couldn't find his address. Then I can watch all those movies again, as much as I want. I'm sure Zach will love them too. Are you sure you want to take that trash home? Jaden asked quietly. Jake looked up at his friend in surprise. Jaden's eyes were searching. They pricked his heart. Does Jaden know what's on this laptop? He wondered. I thought he always was asleep when we were watching stuff. Unfortunately, Jake didn't have the courage to ask or the motivation to talk things through with his friend and seek advice. Jake wanted the laptop. The beast within was crying out for more. I'm sure Brett will know how to get in touch with Trevor, he told his friend, avoiding his eyes. I'll give it to Brett if I can't find the address myself. Inserting the laptop into his sports bag, Jake took one last look around the cabin before heading out the door. His bag was much, much heavier now. Inside was ample sustenance to feed many monsters and spin his thoughts completely out of control. 
Seeing it as sensational entertainment, unaware of the poisonous effect it would have in his heart, Jake stifled all pricks of conscience. Uneasy with the decision, but afraid to create a rift in their friendship, Jaden shrugged and silently followed his friend out the door. Chapter 18. In the Heart Uncle George's last class was on covetousness. Zack had seen the title in the program book and had an inkling the class would be on materialism. His dad had often made such a connection. The session began with the warning Jesus had given in Luke 21 about the last days. Hannah read the passage out to the class. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Notice what the world will be like when Jesus returns, Uncle George pointed out. Jesus doesn't tell us we will have to endure fiery persecution like believers in ages gone by, although this is an ongoing problem in some countries. He isn't telling us to pray that we might survive famines and terrible pestilences, although there are believers today in some parts of our world who struggle to find enough to eat. No, Jesus is telling us that the majority of believers will be living at a time of plenty, with lots of wasteful parties and pleasure-filled opportunities consuming their lives. The pursuit of pleasure may be what will keep us out of the kingdom. Jesus says that if we become caught up with our indulgent, busy society, we may miss the signs of his return. We may not be ready. It hit home to Zach. He felt convicted that the indulgent world by which he had been so mindlessly enveloped was suffocating his interest in spiritual matters. He had been willingly oblivious to the signs of Christ's return, which Uncle James had listed in his talk the night before. And I missed that same talk a few weeks ago, going to a dance that left me with a concussion. These verses are a warning to me, he marveled. I've been missing the words of Jesus. I'm not heading toward the kingdom. I'm ignoring the call. I'm running in the opposite direction. Now, I've chosen to talk about covetousness in my last class, Uncle George explained, because I believe this is one of the most serious issues drawing us away from God in our world today especially in our Western world. The problem of covetousness affects rich and poor, old and young, everyone. The problem of covetousness affects rich and poor, young and old, no matter where we live in the world. However, I do feel that in Western civilization, the thorns are much thicker and many more are being choked. Uncle George started with an interesting passage from Ezekiel chapter 14. In that chapter, God clearly told Ezekiel that he wouldn't listen to the men of Judah because they had idols in their hearts. We know the way Josiah combated idolatry when he was the king of Judah. Uncle George reminded them. Josiah went out and smashed every idol to powder. Many of the teens nodded, remembering their study of King Josiah at kids camp the year before. Uncle George continued. We talked this week about the advice Jesus gave us to combat a problem when it's taking us away from God. Jesus tells us to cut it off. Whether it be an eye or a hand, it needs to be forsaken, blocked, tossed out of the living room window and hurled far away. But how do we get rid of an idol in the heart? Has anyone ever struggled to combat an idol in the heart? The class looked uncertain. Zach wasn't sure what Uncle George meant. What was an idol in the heart? Uncle George read Colossians 3 verses 1 to 5 from the RSV. If then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things which are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry." He emphasized, On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. So what is the link to idolatry in those verses? Uncle George asked. Zach put up his hand. It says that covetousness is idolatry, but I'm not sure I understand why. With his Power Bible computer program on the screen, Uncle George showed them the meaning of covetousness. Covetousness, he said, 
is the Greek word pleonexia, which means avarice, that is, by implication, fraudulency, extortion, covetousness, practices, greediness. When Uncle George examined the root word pleonectes, they discovered it had the meaning holding or desiring more, that is, eager for gain. In other words, Uncle George said, covetousness is longing for something more, something you want to possess. Displaying the Ten Commandments on the screen from Exodus chapter 20, Uncle George pointed out the last commandment, which was, You shall not covet. God told us not to covet, Uncle George said, and he listed out various things that we are inclined to covet, just to make sure we get the point. What are we told not to covet? Brennan replied, Your neighbor's mansion, his wife, his servants, or his animals, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, what might God add if he was giving this commandment today? Uncle George asked with a smile. The class had many suggestions. Cars, iPods, iPads, Blu-ray players, expensive clothes, expensive pets, luxury cruises in the Mediterranean. The list went on and on. Uncle George laughed. I'm glad you're getting the point. He said. Anything that competes with God and his son for our hearts, our time, and our dedication is an idol. If we're willing to sin to get it, then it's an idol. So we need to ask ourselves, what keeps us from having time or money to spread the gospel and to help those in need? What excuses are we giving for why we can't take part in the preaching efforts or make the Bible class or attend study days? What do we find ourselves thinking about, obsessing over, and crowding out spiritual thoughts? Uncle George gave everyone time to consider those questions and ponder them privately. It wasn't hard for Zach to answer the questions for himself. However, he recoiled at the thought of parting from the things he knew he cherished more than God. Maybe they're okay as long as they don't come before God, he told himself. Maybe I just need to revamp my priorities. Now, a further question to consider. Uncle George continued. Let's say you own a nice sports car, but in order to pay for it, you have to take a second job. With two jobs, you don't have time to do much else than work, sleep, and drive your fast, flashy car. You may decide it is an idol for you. Can you get rid of it? Mm, you could sell it. Noah suggested. You can. Uncle George agreed. You can sell it, give it away, or even smash it or burn it if you have to. It's a physical thing, and it can be physically removed. But what if you don't own a nice sports car, or even have the money to afford one, but you long for one in your heart? What if you wake up in the middle of the night longing for that gorgeous brand new Corvette, or that flashy blue Porsche? What if you find yourself consumed by schemes of how you can make enough money to buy a Lamborghini? Or worse, find yourself thinking of ways to steal one? What will you do? How will you get rid of an idol in the heart? No hands went up. Everyone just looked at Uncle George with blank expressions. They had no idea. He nodded thoughtfully. This is a problem you will face at some point in your life, he told them. Do you think the problem will go away if you decide never to look at car magazines again and avoid going past dealerships? Everyone thought about it. Brennan spoke up. That might help, but you may still see one as you're driving on the highway. We're supposed to flee temptation, Hannah suggested with a shrug. <laughs> Good point, Hannah. Uncle George praised. And we often cite the example of Joseph as an example in that regard. But what if you decide to flee from civilization and live in the remote mountains of British Columbia? Will you no longer have the idol in your heart? Some of the class thought it would go away. Others weren't so sure. My guess, Uncle George said, is that even in total isolation, you may still be thinking about how you can get that gorgeous new Corvette. If it is truly an idol in your heart, you can travel halfway around the world and it will still be on your mind. Any other suggestions? Maybe you should just decide to get it, Zach offered with a smile. Once it's yours, then you'll stop thinking about it so much and you can get on with other things. Uncle George asked the rest of the class whether they agreed with Zach. Some did, and some didn't. However, Uncle George replied to Zach, if you have to give everything you have to get it, then you might find yourselves worrying at night about someone taking it away, or what will happen if you crash it. Or if you didn't have enough money to buy it in the first place, you might be consumed by working to pay for the lease. You might even feel guilty for spending so much time and money on yourself, or... Worse yet, if you had to steal it, you might find yourself conscience-stricken and worried that you will be discovered and arrested. Everyone could appreciate the perplexity of the problem. 
There is a solution. Uncle George smiled. Just tell yourself to forget about it. Noah chimed in. Be satisfied with the old Dodge Caravan that your parents don't want anymore. It has more room anyway. Noah's closest friends laughed, knowing that he had just inherited an old Dodge Caravan. With a nod, Uncle George acknowledged this was a possibility. Paul does counsel us to choose contentment. He agreed. We can read his advice in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Zach skimmed through verses 6 to 10 as they were read out loud. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Uncle George pointed out the consequences of falling into a covetous state, and told everyone that contentment was a choice of mind that would help in the situation. However, he went on to say, some idols in the heart refuse to go away, regardless of how we might tell ourselves to forget about them. We may frustrate ourselves for years trying to overcome our fleshly desires by simply telling them to go away. We can't fight flesh with the flesh. Often such a focus on what we want to forget only leads it to lodging more firmly at the forefront of our mind. He paused and looked at the class. There is an aggressive, effective method to overcome an idol in the heart. The class waited anxiously to hear the solution. Beginning with the passage, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Uncle George explained that it is necessary to examine the source of the evil that is gripping our hearts and positively pursue the opposite. He took everyone to Ephesians chapter 4 and led them through verses 22 to the end. There he pointed out that Paul counsels believers to put off the old man by putting on the new man created in Christ. If someone struggles with telling lies, they are to focus positively on speaking the truth. If they are tempted to steal, they are to concentrate on giving to others. If they find themselves swearing or speaking rudely, they are to make an earnest effort to edify others with wholesome words. Anger and bitterness are to be overcome by a deliberate attempt to be kind and forgiving. Ephesians chapter 4 is an aggressively, positively focused plan to combat evil by doing what is good. Now, not all of you will be tempted by the gorgeous new Corvette you see parked on the street. Uncle George smiled, looking especially at the girls in his class. But if your idol is a beautiful mansion, or a wardrobe of fine clothes or other things, you may have a desire to be wealthy. If this is your idol, then listen to what Jesus told the rich young ruler. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Overcome the idol of mammon by giving your time and money to a worthy cause in Christ. Some of you, he continued, looking across the whole group, may be filled with desire for your own fame, glory, and honor, or pursuing the perfect, physically fit body. Zach squirmed. Are you bowing to the demands of the world? Uncle George questioned. Are you striving for glory and honor now, before the kingdom? You may gain it for a few short decades, if you're lucky, but Jesus warns that you may gain the whole world and lose your own soul. Choose to be like Moses, who walked away from the seducing opportunity for fame and advancement in Egypt and suffered affliction with the people of God instead. Perhaps some of you are coveting another person. Uncle George suggested. Zach sat up straight. Are you finding yourself sinfully fantasizing about another person? Uncle George asked the class. If you have an imagination that spins out of control in destructive ways, harness your thoughts and efforts to turn that creative energy into something positive and helpful. Be inventive with a new preaching activity that you can throw your creative abilities into. Pray for God's help to edify that person spiritually. Use your imagination to think through ways you might help them or others to do what is right and grow in faith and service to God. It suddenly occurred to Zach how much all this applied to him. He wanted Melissa, and Melissa didn't belong to him. He had never woken up in the night thinking how he could get a gorgeous new Corvette, but he certainly had plenty of dreams about Melissa. 
Even here at Manitoulin, thousands of kilometers away from Nova Scotia, she was as much in his heart as when he was dancing with her side by side. He began to realize that he was consumed with a number of things in a far more powerful way than he was with God. Was Uncle George offering a solution that would work? Until now, my first goal has been to make Melissa my girlfriend, he realized. Perhaps I need to consider how I can help Melissa and Jaden find the truth and live forever. Maybe I need to use my imagination for a worthwhile project in service to God. Then Zach shook his head and sighed. Mm, even before that, he told himself firmly, I need to concentrate on becoming a new man myself. How can I encourage others to be baptized and commit their life to Christ when I haven't even made that decision? It's time to change. Chapter 19. Forever, Friends. Zack straightened his collar. Looking into the small mirror that Aunt Sandra had hung on the maple tree, he carefully added a little gel to his short, stubby hair. It was the last evening of camp, and as always, there were musical and dramatic performances from all age groups to close out the week. One week was far too short. Zack couldn't believe how sad he felt that it was coming to an end so soon. He wished he could spend his whole summer here with Uncle James and Aunt Sandra, listening to the talks that were changing his perspective, hanging out with Noah and Brennan and even Hannah. That's quite a shirt, Aunt Sandra commented, coming out of the trailer. She was dressed up to go to evening performance as well. Zack looked proudly down at his shiny crimson shirt. It had come through the pummeling rather well. The rip in the sleeve had been expertly repaired by his mom, and since the bloodstains had been almost the same color, there were no traces to be seen. It was still his favorite shirt. Trying to catch the lady's eyes? Uncle James teased, following his wife out of the trailer. He sniffed the air. Nice smell, he exclaimed. Did you use the whole can of Axe? Just trying to keep them mosquitoes away. Zack grinned. Right. Uncle James nodded, fully unconvinced. It was with a heavy heart that Zack followed his aunt and uncle to the main pavilion. One week isn't long enough, he told Uncle James, a little surprised by the wave of emotion he felt. I've got to get back here for youth conference somehow. Putting his arm around his nephew's shoulders, Uncle James chuckled. If Alan is driving, I'm sure he'll appreciate your company. Yeah. Zack agreed. He's been trying to talk us into going since January. Noah was saving a seat for him in the pavilion, and Zack took it appreciatively. He looked around for Hannah and saw her a few rows ahead with her friends. Her long blonde hair was a mass of ringlets. Zack sighed. You okay? Noah asked. I just can't believe this is already the last night, Zack moaned. I'm not ready to go home. Then why not stay? Noah asked, as if it was the easiest thing in the world to arrange. My parents would be happy to have you. I'd love to, Zack exclaimed. But I have to work. Jake and I are helping Alan run Uncle Peter's landscaping business while he's in Jamaica. He paused reflectively. But I am planning to come back for youth conference, somehow or other. Yay! Noah cheered. And see if you can stay for the week after as well. Okay. And you're going to choose Dalhousie, right? I probably will. Noah nodded. If I can stay with you. Then he paused thoughtfully and added, You know, Zach, after all the great talks this week, I've been thinking I might just take this year off and do missionary work someplace. I'm finally out of school and free to make choices. I'd like to give a year of my life completely to God. Zack nodded in stunned silence. Noah wants to do missionary work? Noah wants to give a year of his life to God? Really? There were many performances that night, beginning with the youngest classes singing Bible songs, and then a play by the intermediates, and finally the teen choir. When 80 teens squeezed onto the platform to sing the songs they had been practicing all week, it was by far the largest age group. Zack found his place in the choir behind Hannah and tweaked one of her long golden ringlets. She turned and gave him one of her fully enchanting smiles. Zack smiled back. Hannah was looking quite spectacular. The teen's practice was more than evident, and not one song was boring. In fact, Zack had been surprised by how much he had enjoyed the experience. The title of the final song was Here at Last. 
It was a glorious piece of music that climaxed with a chorus rejoicing over the return of Jesus to the earth and the change we will undergo when we are granted immortality. As Zach sang with the others, he felt another wave of emotion. What's wrong with me? He wondered. I'm becoming an emotional basket case. All week long, he had been practicing the very same songs, but only now did he truly feel the impact of their meaning. We will all be changed. In a moment grasped in time, he sang with all the others. In the, in the twinkling of an eye, the dead shall all arise at the trumpet's final call, when God is all in all. Zach actually felt as though the sentiments in the chorus were his own. Tears were welling up in his eyes. He really wanted to be there when Jesus returns and grants everlasting life to the believers. This meant something to him. It was in his heart. How did one week change me so drastically? He asked himself. The campfire was blazing up into the dark night sky as Zach followed Noah and Hannah. Since the evening program had lasted longer than usual, and there had been an ice cream social afterward, the teen devotional was late in starting. It was almost 11 o'clock. You and Noah should talk your parents into coming out to Nova Scotia this summer, Zach told Hannah. They haven't been back for years. They must miss everyone and the ocean. I'll try, she smiled sweetly. I know they miss everyone. We all do. Maybe if something big was happening, like a study weekend, or a preaching campaign, or even a baptism, they'd consider making the trip. Zach looked over. He couldn't miss her meaningful glance. There just might be a baptism, he said with a smile. Unless, of course, the candidate fails the interview. Hannah looked up excitedly. You? she asked. Oh, one of the Bryant twins. There was only one Bryant twin that wasn't baptized. Hannah was elated. We could get baptized on the same day and then we'll be twins, she said eagerly. With a laugh, Zach tweaked another one of her springy curls. Maybe, he said. It was an interesting suggestion. He liked the way his friendship with Hannah encouraged him to live for God. Picnic tables surrounded the campfire and Zach motioned to Hannah to sit beside him. She didn't need any convincing. All the teens crowded in and Noah and Brennan joined them on the table. Uncle Mark, who was Hannah and Noah's father, was giving the devotion that evening, and he had brought his guitar. To begin with, they all sang their favorite campfire hymns. Zach noticed that Uncle James and Aunt Sandra were across from them, singing along in the shadows. He remembered that this was what Aunt Sandra said she loved best about camp. Looking up at the stars, he sang with the others, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Zach felt closer to God than he ever had felt in his life. I'm ready to commit my life to you, Lord. He prayed. I thought I was missing out on all this world had to offer, but now I realize that what I truly want is right here with you. All that I've been chasing after is soon to be taken away, judged, destroyed, and your son is coming back to set the world right. I want to be there with him. I want to help cleanse the earth and bring this whole world to see and know your truth. Heavenly Father, please help me to change. Please help me to remember all this when I get back home and not to set up idols in my heart where you belong. Uncle Mark stood up to give the devotion, and everyone fell silent. The crackling fire could be heard distinctly. A whippoorwill cry echoed across the nearby lake. Using his flashlight to see his notes, Uncle Mark spoke about discipleship and what it really means to follow Jesus. He impressed on all of them what love Jesus had shown in giving up his life completely for the salvation of others. He reminded everyone of God's love in giving his Son, and providing a way for believers to have their sins forgiven and to come boldly unto the throne of grace. And remember, he told them earnestly, that Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Uncle Mark then talked about counting the cost and realizing that to follow Christ is to make a decision to give up one's life now to serve God and his Son. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? Serving God is a very serious commitment, Uncle Mark said, because God wants our whole heart, soul, and mind. He's not interested in a half-hearted response. Now, I want you to look around at everyone here tonight, Uncle Mark said to the group as he came to the conclusion of his thoughts. You all have good friends back at home, where you will be heading tomorrow. Some of them may be in the truth. 
Some may come to the truth through you. But I want you to value the relationships you've made this week. These are your forever friends. Zack looked around at all the faces in the flickering firelight. My forever friends, he mused. These are the friends you hope to live with eternally in God's kingdom, Uncle Mark went on to say. Value them. Help them. Don't lose touch with each other. Don't let them go. Noah put his arm around Zack. In a sudden outpouring of affection, Zack put his arms around Noah and Hannah. Forever friends, he whispered. Hannah looked up with a smile, and then she likewise put her arms around Zack and the girl sitting next to her. In a matter of seconds, the whole group had embraced each other in the circle. Even Uncle James and Aunt Sandra were included. Uncle Mark smiled and nodded his approval. Encourage each other throughout this next year, he told them. Tell your friends to hang on to God's promises. Don't allow each other to be swallowed up by the cares of this life or the pleasures of sin for a season. But stand strong. When Jesus returns, we want him to find faith on the earth. We want him to find that persistent faith is in us. Don't give up. They all bowed their heads as Uncle Mark gave a prayer to end the evening. Uncle Mark prayed for all the young people. He prayed that God would keep them safe on their return home and strong in faith through the upcoming year. Zach felt tears build up behind his eyelids. He was glad it was dark. When the prayer was over, many of the young people stood up to leave. The group hugs slowly dissolved, but Zach didn't want the evening to end. Seeing that it was past midnight and past curfew, most people were retiring to bed. Hey, do you have a cell phone? Noah asked. <laughs> a smartphone, actually, but it's at home, Zach replied, hoping Jake was taking good care of it. Thankfully, Noah didn't ask why he had left it at home. He just said, I'll give you my number before you leave tomorrow, and then we can text each other. That'd be good, Zach agreed. He looked over at Hannah. You can text me, too, she smiled. Okay, Zach said. So, both of you need to give me your numbers tomorrow, and maybe we should do emails, too. That means you both have to be up at 7 o'clock to, to say goodbye. There was a catch in Zach's voice, and for a moment, he didn't trust himself to say anything more. We'll be, we'll there. be there, they assured him. Hannah touched his arm. Good night, Zach, she said reluctantly. Uncle Mark had his flashlight in hand to guide her way back to the campsite. Zack nodded and swallowed her, but he didn't say anything. He wasn't ready to say goodnight to anyone. Goodbye was going to be even harder. Chapter 20. The Decision Following Uncle James and Aunt Sandra back to their campsite, Zach wished he could talk to someone. Uncle James? He said meekly. I guess we need to get our sleep tonight for the big trip tomorrow. Uncle James looked at him in a puzzled sort of way. We will need to be up early, Zach. He began to say, and then he looked more closely at his nephew's face. You okay? Zach didn't speak. He just shook his head and shrugged. Uncle James laid his hand on his nephew's shoulder and motioned to his wife to carry on to the campsite. Stopping to give her husband a kiss, Aunt Sandra said goodnight to both of them and made her way down the road with her flashlight in hand. What's up? Uncle James asked as they walked slowly out to the large playing field. It seemed so long ago that they had watched the stars on that very first night. Just as before, it seemed to Zach that the sky was teeming with millions of tiny, twinkling lights. There was no one else on the field. Around them, in the shelter of the trees, a few lantern lights shone softly while families got ready for bed. Uncle James, this week has changed my life, Zack blurted out emotionally. Unwanted tears began running down his face. I don't know what's wrong with me, he tried to explain to his uncle, embarrassed. I have no idea why I'm crying. It's okay, Zack, his uncle assured him calmly, rubbing his back. Concussions can lead to a heightened emotional state, but it's just you and me here, and I understand. Waiting for his nephew to gain control, Uncle James was quiet for a while before he asked, Why has your life changed, Zack? I came up here wishing I'd gone to the basketball camp with Jake, Zack explained with a shrug. And, and now I, I don't want to go home. I don't want to go back to being the person I was. And I'm worried that I will. Up here, I can see that the return of Jesus could, could be very soon. <laughs> Maybe before the provincials university, and, and all the other cares of this life that drag me down. I'd forgotten how great my friends are here, and how much I care about them. 
how much God's plan of salvation is, is so much better than anything the world offers. Oh, I forget so easily. I always lose touch with my friends here, and I need them. I need them, Uncle James. I need them to help me remember what's really important in life. Oh, what do I do? Sitting down on one of the large rocks that lined the playing field, Uncle James looked up at Zack thoughtfully. What do you want to do? Zack paced back and forth. I want to be baptized. I need to be baptized. But I'm worried that I'll get back home and be sucked right back into the way I was before. Zack! Uncle James exclaimed with surprise, standing back up to give him a hug. That's wonderful to hear. You want to be baptized? That's great! The hug was warmly appreciated. But, but what if... Zack pondered uneasily when his uncle sat back down. What if when I get back home I feel differently? What will make you change your mind? Uncle James asked. Rubbing his short hair with his hand, Zack contemplated the matter. Girls, basketball, being too busy. He listed. In, in what way? I just forget about the long-term view of it all. I get wrapped up in the here and now and... Before I know it, other things have crowded God out of my life. So what's made the difference this week, Zack? How have you come to this new perspective? Zack thought long and hard. I guess getting away from everything. He replied. And all the great talks on the Bible. He paused and then added forcefully. It sure helps a lot to have good friends. Uncle James considered the matter. It's good for all of us to get away from the pull of the world. He agreed. Up here... Whether we've come to listen or not, we're spoon-fed. God's word is poured into us in this calm wilderness with no worldly distractions. That spirit word can take root in our hearts. Looking around, Zach had to agree. The camp was a wilderness, rugged, natural, quiet, and isolated from many of the tempting sights and sounds that modern civilization brings. But Zach, his uncle continued earnestly, God's word isn't restricted to the wilderness of the desert. God can reach you anywhere if you give him your ear. You felt his power this week, even though you might have been initially resisting. Imagine what God will do for you if you willingly choose to open your heart to him. True. Listening to God is the first important step, Zach. Uncle James encouraged. Making a commitment to him is the next. You know then that you won't be on your own. God will be doing all he can to help you win the battle but you may need to adjust your priorities. You know how hard you've been training to win the provincials. If you want to keep this new perspective and grow in Christ, you'll have to ensure that every day you're getting your spiritual food and your spiritual exercise. That will be vital to grow. Like prayer and reading? Praying, reading, studying, and finding ways to live for Christ. It takes time and commitment and thought. It may mean giving up other things. Giving up other things? Zack sighed. What would they be? He wasn't sure he could give up anything just yet. Here at Manitoulin, it had all been taken away from him. Giving things up willingly would be much harder. Uncle James, that's what worries me. Zack confessed. I'm not sure I'll be able to do that when I get home. Uncle James looked up at him thoughtfully. Pray about it, Zack. He encouraged. Let God show you the way. I think you're ready to make this decision. God will be on your side. The conversation went on much longer. It was late when Zack and his uncle finally headed to the campsite to sleep. Zack crawled into his sleeping bag with a new resolve that he felt confident he could sustain. He had asked Uncle James to make all the necessary arrangements for his baptism once they got home. Following his uncle's advice, he had decided he would set aside a time every day to work on the youth conference study, and aside from his job with Eden Tree, everything else would have to revolve around his new goals. If he met up with Melissa, he planned to share his hope with her, but that was it. He wasn't going to try and date a girl who was pulling him away from God. I'll invite her to my baptism, he thought sleepily. I'll invite her and Shane and, and Jaden. I'm going to focus on trying to share God's truth with Melissa, I'm not winning her as my girlfriend. He groaned and rolled over. It was easy enough to set such goals, but he still wasn't sure how it all pan out. As he lay in the dark, listening to the breeze blow wistfully through the trees, the crickets chirp quietly in the bushes, and a bloodthirsty mosquito hover outside his tent window, Zack was very thankful for his uncle. 
Uncle James agreed with his new perspective. He understood that dedication to God was more important than winning any basketball game or getting the best marks in math. I think Brett understands that perspective, too, Zach reflected, remembering how considerate Brett had been about the basketball camp. But considerate isn't the same as encouraging, he decided. I think Brett struggles just as much as I do to keep godly priorities front and center. He's a fantastic basketball coach, but he may not be someone that will give me the best spiritual advice.